This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. How are you this week? I have a feeling you haven't had enough water today, so why don't you grab a bottle or a glass? So, this week is a little different. I was originally going to take a hiatus because I'm going out of town all week next week, and I wanted to get a jump start on the Thanksgiving episode. Wow, my chair is just extra creaky today. I'm sorry about that. But I got a very sweet letter this week from a listener named Izzy, who mentioned that the show coming out every week meant a lot to them. So here I am, with a little mini episode. I'm also going to tack on a preview for my new Patreon series. If you haven't heard, I am reading the entirety of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein over on Patreon. There it goes! Oh my god! I don't- I'm- I'm barely moving. I'm barely moving. It's rainy here today, and I don't know if that- has anything to do with anything, but I'm, I'm gonna blame the rain on the creakiness. <laughs> Just think about it as we're in a creaky, scary haunted house together and the walls are just, you know, being extra creepy. Okay, back to Frankenstein. It's a beautiful and moody novel that mentions cold and rain a lot, so it's perfect for winter. So over the next few weeks, I'll be releasing it in several parts. Currently, the preface, are, if you're familiar, it's the letters in the beginning, and chapters one and two are available. One interesting thing I noticed, I have a couple different copies of it, and depending on the copy you have, the chapters may be broken up differently. The one I'm reading is broken up into much longer chapters than another little paperback version I have. So if you're reading along, or you want to reread after you listen just to grasp it a little better, which I totally understand, anything written before the 1930s can get pretty flowery, but if you are reading along, your chapters may not line up with mine. So for as little as a dollar a month, you can have access to this cool new series that I'm really excited about. I want my higher tier patrons to know that after the new year, I'm going, I'm looking to come out with tier specific content as well. But just thought all my patrons would enjoy a little classic horror along with your hot chocolate on a cozy night in. Now, on to this week's story. I've begun slowly collecting all of the Pan Book of Horror series. I've talked about it before on here, I, I believe. It's a series that was printed solely in England, Canada, and Australia from the 1950s to the 1980s. The story I have for you this week is delightfully witty, as well as completely horrific and stomach-churning. This is by author Martin Waddell, and it's called Suddenly After a Good Supper. Dennis was at rest in the midst of a crowd of his relations, but he was not aware of their presence, for it was dark inside the vault, and darker still inside his coffin. He was alive, and the rest of them were dead. Their location was all they had in common. It was a horrible predicament, but Dennis had not yet regained consciousness sufficiently to realize it. If he dreamed in his, by now, light coma. It was of a sumptuous supper he had enjoyed in the old lodge inn, east of Briding, and the long walk across the downs to Afterhill, which had followed. A walk through the best of autumn worlds. On this high note, his life had apparently ended. He now lay in a damp, dark vault, with a particularly nauseous smell, which could only be blamed on the onset of decay in his granny, whom he had buried the week previously. Dennis had apparently passed quietly in his sleep. His face bore no trace of the licentious life he had lived, but had obligingly composed itself in an expression of pious innocence, 
which wronged the man as much as it delighted his aunt, the last of the line. It is not amusing, in the light of what subsequently happened to Dennis, to learn that his father and grandfather had passed away in exactly the same fashion. Suddenly, after a good supper. His brother William, mercifully, had died on active service, mourned only by the man who had to scrape him off the wall over which he had been somewhat stickily distributed. William, it would seem, was the lucky one. No one but his aunt was at all concerned at his passing. She was really rather pleased. Granny, godson, and aunt had lived a long time in Afferhill, in a state of mutual resentment. To follow granny and grandson to the grave had more than delighted the maiden lady, though charitably we must assume that even she did not imagine for a moment that, as they laid him in the tomb of his ancestors, Dennis was lightly breathing, all unseen in his coffin. In the nature of the family's malaise, it took the subject the best part of four days to regain consciousness, and this interval in itself had so far been sufficient to ensure that no one was around to answer their frantic knocking when it came. With Dennis, all this was to change. If he had been kind and considerate to his elderly relatives, he would have gone the way of the rest of the family. Bad enough. As it was, he, well, he got what he deserved. On the morning of the fourth day, the day after his internment in the vault beneath the Afferhill Church, Dennis at last opened his eyes in a white satin world. It was a narrow world, for his arms were pinned across his chest by carefully concealed stitches that held them to his jacket. Some hours later, he finally found the strength to attempt a movement, but he was held tight. This, in a way, was his own fault, for he had, quite by chance, ended up in the coffin of the aunt who had now outlived him. On his sudden death, she had felt it incumbent upon her to let him have it, his need being more pressing. Dennis, in a spiteful mood one day, had made up a box for each aunt and granny, a gesture which had become a matter for more severe acrimony between the trio, for the two ladies took it as an indication that he wished to get rid of them, as indeed he did. The remaining aunt was only too happy to see her unpleasant nephew installed in the coffin he had especially made for her, and, if proved a trifle too small for him, then that was just too bad. She had him put in very quickly, being a methodical old lady, managing to bend his legs a little before rigor mortis set in, or what passed for rigor mortis in the eyes of the medical men, from Dennis's point of view, an unfortunate assumption. Had his knees not been thus inexpertly bent by his aunt, the coffin might have closed quite comfortably over him, but, as it was, the lid did not quite seal out the air. Damp, musty, dead air, with something of the odor of his dead granny's decay in it. Air seeped through the gap between the imperfectly fitted lid and the box and kept him from smothering which may have been the fate of his father and grandfather. At least it is charitable to hope so. He tried to press up the satin-lined lid that held him down. He tried, and tried again, with what strength he could muster. He battered upon it. He shouted. But there was only his dead granny to hear. At least, she was the only person around with eardrum left unrotted. The rest were quite past that stage, poor dears. Not that his grandmother's unrotted ears were much use to her then, or to Dennis, though they were later to prove quite a delicacy. It was of no avail. He passed rapidly from fear to desperation and from desperation to exhaustion. When he once more awoke, he was no better off. The satin still pressed down upon his cheek his rouged cheek, for his aunt had done her best by him. He lay perfectly still in the silence of the coffin, all too conscious that what little strength he had was fast dwindling, that a gnawing hunger lurked outside his fear, a hunger matched only by his intense thirst. 
he had to get out of his aunt's coffin. Dennis was not without resource. He knew certain of the secrets of his aunt's coffin, one of which was that, although it seemed to be made of the very best wood, it was not. The coffin making had been an unpleasant gesture, typical of the man, but he had never seriously intended to bury either of the two ladies in style. He had paid for a good class varnish, but not for good wood. The coffin was, as coffins go, a frail affair. He thought over this aspect of his dilemma calmly, or at least as calmly as he could be expected to, considering the cruel circumstances in which he found himself. He knew the vault quite well, having inspected it prior to the occasion of his granny's funeral. It was of an oblong shape, with coffins laid in orderly ranks along the racks, three to a space on each rack. He knew just where his own coffin must be situated. On top of that, of his great uncle Mortimer, some 80 years dead, and he realized that if he could but cause great uncle Mortimer's crumbling coffin to give way beneath the weight which had been placed upon it, the two coffins might together fall to the stone floor of the vault, with every chance that the one which contained him would burst open. To achieve this not inconsiderable feat, it was necessary for him to attempt to jog his own coffin from within, and this proved extraordinarily difficult. Had his coffin not been so light and ill-made, it is doubtful if he could have brought it off, but bring it off he did. The coffin rocked on top of long, dead Mortimer's. Mortimer, who had distressingly passed away in his sleep suddenly, after a good supper, and the old rotten box gradually began to give way. At last, Dennis felt his own coffin tilt a little and redoubled his efforts. There came a soft crunching sound, which was the impact of his coffin shell on Mortimer's exposed thigh bone. A jolt, and a jolt, and yet another jolt, and Dennis's coffin began to slip. Then. He was falling, and the next moment the coffin jarred on the stone floor of the vault, and he lost consciousness. He woke with something gray and dusty on his chest, something held within a crumbling veil of shroud, something mummy-like, a wizened brown face set against his cheek in a desperate grin, crumbled lips and bared gums, eyes like yellowed peas in their socket pods. The falling coffins had jumbled them together, limb for limb. Dennis and what was left of Mortimer. No matter. He was out. The door of the vault allowed a thin stream of light by its hinges, and in it he could see the coffin set in order around him. Here and there the gleam of a white bone through crumbled wood, a cobweb which was withering cloth, or skin. He put the dusty, disintegrating thing, which was Mortimer, against the side of his broken coffin, cleared as much as he could of the corpse dust from his hair and eyes, and consoled himself with the thought that the worst was over. He had only to get out of the vault. He had only to get out of the vault. This task he faced with confidence, not unfounded. The strange malaise of the family, which he had only now come to understand, that which had sent a seeming death to one member after another, suddenly, after a good supper. This strange, swift sickness had been anticipated by at least one family member who had been much mocked for his pains. Thankfully, Dennis now turned his mind to finding the chain that led up through the earth to the death bell in the graveyard above a bell reserved for the use of the living dead who were normally sealed in their coffins and unable to get out. It had been a cold and blustery afternoon in the world which Dennis had left behind him. The wind had whirred and burred through the larches which overhung the graveyard wall. The rain had lashed monotonously down on the church roof. A slate or two had shattered on the paving stones below. Otherwise, all were well, but inside, out of the cold. By five o'clock, a storm had risen, 
A gale roared over the headland, and sea pounded the pier at the front door of the church lane. In the semi-darkness of his vault, down in the church foundations, poor Dennis knew nothing of all this. He was miserably groping around in the gloom, searching for the bell chain. He slithered over moist coffins, tangling his erring hands in the bodies of those long dead, embroiled his feet in random rib cages as coffin after coffin crumbled beneath his weight. His only course of comfort was the moisture on the walls. He sopped it up with the end of his shroud, which he then pressed to his mouth, so that at least he had a little to drink. It helped, but it did not ease the demand of his gnawing hunger. He forced himself to forget everything but the chain, and at length, he found it. He had very little energy left, but he laced his fingers in the links and allowed himself to swing against it. In the world above, the bell tolled faintly amid the clash of lightning and the rolling of thunder, the distant hum of the sea and the swift pattering of the rain. Its note rang out over the deserted graveyard, but otherwise was lost in the bustle of the elements. People went to their beds undisturbed, without imagining for a moment that Dennis was hanging from the other end of the chain, his knees resting on a dead nephew. Later, it must have been much later, he wakened to find that his nephew's ribs had given away and the snapped bones had raked his thighs. There was no voice to cheer him, no sound from the outside, just the still of the corpses round him, the yellow white of exposed bones. The bell was no good. He had to try another way. He had to get out. The steel door of the vault could not be opened. No way out there. But if he could remove some of the brickwork around him, he needed an instrument to work with. The third coffin he opened provided him with what he was looking for, an unrotted thigh bone. He detached it from the skeleton of a dead relation and hacked vainly with it at the plaster joining the bricks. He made no impression. The effort almost finished him. The desperate craving for food finally overcame him, now that the last hope had seemingly slipped away. At first, he tried eating the damp edge of his shroud, but that was no good. He'd have to find food if he was going to live. He took one of Mortimer's few bones that remained intact and tried to gnaw on it, but Mortimer's bone crumbled in his hands. He tried eating moss from the damp floor, scraping it up with his fingernails, but there was not enough, not nearly enough. He no longer had the desire to do anything but find food to ease his craving. It was then, and only then, that he remembered his granny. The storm had settled when the bell began to ring again, and this time it was heard by several people, and with great annoyance. It was, after all, two o'clock in the morning, though Dennis was not to know that, and he would not really have cared if he had, the bell tolled loudly, fed with all the strength and vigor of the desperate man below, tolling for his life. Church warden, vicar, then policeman, one by one, they climbed the hill to the graveyard, saw the bell and the moving chain. It was, they supposed, something to do with the storm. An underground stream, said the policeman, without much conviction. They really should go down to look. This idea appealed to no one. It was the middle of the night, and a graveyard, and the bell was, when all was said and done, the property of the living dead. The vicar, a practical man, was for removing the clapper and going away. But the policeman had his duty and insisted. It was necessary in the circumstances to summon Dennis's aunt from her bed, which she quitted with great reluctance. And, this done, they took torches and trudgeons to the source of the trouble. It was a solemn procession which found its way through the old oak doors, 
and down the damp steps to the crypt. An unpleasant and ill-frequented place at the best of times, dead end lodging for the local nobility. Down the flagstoned aisle they walked, at last coming to the great steel door. What followed was unpleasant for everyone but Dennis. The door swung violently open after they unbolted it and Dennis staggered out, a wild figure in a ripped shroud, his nails torn with scraping for moss, his language, especially when addressed to his aunt, profane. In considerable confusion, they carried him away upstairs and laid him on the purple cushions of a pew, while the church warden was sent scurrying across the green for the local doctor. It was his aunt who first noticed the knob of bone, which Dennis clasped in his hand. Thick flesh straggling from it, ripped sinew a dangle against the tattered shroud. It was the gravedigger who had the unpleasant task of reassembling what was left of the still fresh carcass in the vault below replacing as best he could the bits which had been chewed. They kept it to themselves. Even the aunt agreed to that. Dennis, who had never found his granny particularly to his taste, had now to admit to all and sundry that he owed the old lady a great deal. He would not have a word said against her. He had, after all, been miraculously restored to life, suddenly, after a good supper. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life, and one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on, and something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. I hope you enjoyed that story as much as I did. Now for a sneak peek of my Patreon series, Frankenstein. Letter 1. To Mrs. Seville, England. St. Petersburg, December 11th, 17. Redacted. You will rejoice to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you have regarded with such evil forebodings. I arrived here yesterday, and my first task is to assure my dear sister of my welfare and increasing confidence in the success of my undertaking. I am already far north of London, and as I walk in the streets of Petersburg, I feel a cold northern breeze play upon my cheeks, which braces my nerves and fills me with delight. Do you understand this feeling? This breeze which has traveled from the regions towards which I am advancing 
gives me a foretaste of those icy climbs. Inspirited by the wind of promise, my daydreams become more fervent and vivid. I try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is the seat of frost and desolation. It ever presents itself to my imagination as the region of beauty and delight. There, Margaret, the sun is forever visible, its broad disk just skirting the horizon and diffusing a perpetual splendor. There, for with your leave, my sister, I will put some trust in preceding navigators. There, snow and frost are banished, and sailing a calm sea, we may be wafted to a land surpassing in wonders and in beauty every region hitherto discovered on the habitable globe. Its productions and features may be without example, and the phenomena of the heavenly bodies undoubtedly are in those undiscovered solitudes. What may not be expected in a country of eternal light? I may there discover the wondrous power which attracts the needle and may regulate a thousand celestial observations that require only this voyage to render their seeming eccentricities consistent forever. I shall satiate my ardent curiosity with the sight of a part of the world never before visited, and may tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. These are my enticements, and they are sufficient to conquer all fear of danger or death, and to induce me to commence this laborious voyage with the joy a child feels when he embarks in a little boat, with his holiday mates on an expedition of discovery up his native river. But, supposing all these conjectures to be false, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation, by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to reach which, at present, so many months are requisite, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. These reflections have dispelled the agitation with which I began my letter, and I feel my heart glow with an enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much to tranquilize the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye. This expedition has been the favorite dream of my early years. I have read with ardor the accounts of the various voyages which have been made in the prospect of arriving at the North Pacific Ocean through the seas which surround the Pole. You may remember that a history of all the voyages made for purposes of discovery composed the whole of our good Uncle Thomas's library. My education was neglected, yet I was passionately fond of reading. These volumes were my study day and night, and my familiarity with them increased that regret which I had felt as a child on learning that my father's dying injunction had forbidden my uncle to allow me to embark in a seafaring life. These visions faded when I perused, for the first time, those poets whose effusions entranced my soul and lifted it to heaven. I also became a poet, and for one year lived in a paradise of my own creation. I imagined that I also might obtain a niche in the temple where the names of Homer and Shakespeare are consecrated. You are well acquainted with my failure, and how heavily I bore the disappointment. But just at that time I inherited the fortune of my cousin, and my thoughts were turned into the channel of their earlier bent. Six years have passed since I resolved on my present undertaking. I can, even now, remember the hour from which I dedicated myself to this great enterprise. I commenced by injuring my body to hardship. I accompanied the whale fishers on several expeditions to the North Sea. I voluntarily endured cold, famine, thirst, and want of sleep. I often worked harder than the common sailors during the day and devoted my nights to the study of mathematics, the theory of medicine, and those branches of physical science from which a naval adventurer might derive the greatest practical advantage. Twice, I actually hired myself as an undermate in a Greenland whaler, and acquitted myself to admiration. 
I must own I felt a little proud when my captain offered me the second dignity in the vessel and entreated me to remain with the greatest earnestness. So valuable did he consider my services. And now, dear Margaret, do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? My life might have been passed in ease and luxury, but I preferred glory to every enticement that wealth placed in my path. Oh, that some encouraging voice would answer in the affirmative. My courage and my resolution is firm, but my hopes fluctuate and my spirits are often depressed. I am about to proceed on a long and difficult journey, the emergencies of which will demand all my fortitude. I am required not only to raise the spirits of others, but sometimes to sustain my own when theirs are failing. This is the most favorable period for traveling in Russia. They fly quickly over the snow in their sledges. The motion is pleasant and, in my opinion, far more agreeable than that of an English stagecoach. The cold is not excessive if you are wrapped in furs, a dress which I have already adopted, for there is a great difference between walking the deck and remaining seated motionless for hours when no exercise prevents the blood from actually freezing in your veins. I have no ambition to lose my life on the post road between St. Petersburg and Archangel. I shall depart for the latter town in a fortnight or three weeks, and my intention is to hire a ship there, which can easily be done by paying the insurance for the owner, and to engage as many sailors as I think necessary among those who are accustomed to the whale fishing. I do not intend to sail until the month of June. And when shall I return? Dear sister, how can I answer this question? If I succeed, many, many months, perhaps years, will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you will see me again soon. Or never. Farewell, my dear, excellent Margaret. Heaven shower down blessings on you and save me, that I may again and again testify my gratitude for all your love and kindness. Your affectionate brother, R. Walton. Letter 2 To Mrs. Seville, England Archangel, 28th March 17. Redacted How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow. Yet, a second step is taken toward my enterprise. I have hired a vessel and am now occupied in collecting my sailors. Those whom I have already engaged appear to be men on whom I can depend and are certainly possessed of dauntless courage. But I have one want which I have never yet been able to satisfy and the absence of the object of which I now feel as a most severe evil. I have no friend, Margaret. When I am glowing with the enthusiasm of success, there will be none to participate my joy. If I am assailed by disappointment, no one will endeavor to sustain me in dejection. I shall commit my thoughts to paper, it is true, but that is a poor medium for the communication of feeling. I desire the company of a man who could sympathize with me, whose eyes would reply to mine. You deem me romantic, my dear sister, but I bitterly feel the want of a friend. I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as a of a capacious mind whose tastes are like my own, to approve or amend my plans. How would such a friend repair the faults of your poor brother? I am too ardent in execution and too impatient of difficulties, but it is still greater evil to me that I am self-educated. For the first fourteen years of my life I ran wild on a common and read nothing but our Uncle Thomas's books of voyages. At that age, I became acquainted with the celebrated poets of our own country, but it was only when it had ceased to be in my power to derive its most important benefits from such a conviction that I perceived the necessity of becoming acquainted with more languages than that of my native country. 
Now I am 28, and I am in reality more illiterate than many schoolboys of 15. It is true that I have thought more, and that my daydreams are more extended and magnificent, but they want, as the painters call it, keeping. And I greatly need a friend who would have sense enough not to despise me as romantic and affection enough for me to endeavor to regulate my mind. Well, these are useless complaints. I shall certainly find no friend on the wide ocean, nor even here an archangel among merchants and seamen. Yet some feelings, unallied to the dross of human nature, beat even in these rugged bosoms. My lieutenant, for instance, is a man of wonderful courage and enterprise. He is madly desirous of glory. He is an Englishman, and in the midst of national and professional prejudices, unsoftened by cultivation, retains some of the noblest endowments of humanity. I first became acquainted with him on board a whale vessel. Finding that he was unemployed in this city, I easily engaged him to assist in my enterprise. The master is a person of excellent disposition, and is remarkable in the ship for his gentleness and the mildness of his discipline. He is, indeed, of so amiable a nature that he will not hunt, a favorite and almost the only amusement here, because he cannot endure to spill blood. He is, moreover, heroically generous. Some years ago, he loved a young Russian lady of moderate fortune and having amassed a considerable sum in prize money, the father of the girl consented to the match. He saw his mistress once before the destined ceremony, but she was bathed in tears and, throwing herself at his feet, entreated him to spare her, confessing at the same time that she loved another, but that he was poor and her father would never consent to the union. My generous friend reassured the suppliant and, on being informed of the name of her lover, instantly abandoned his pursuit. He had already bought a farm with his money, on which he had designed to pass the remainder of his life. But he bestowed the whole on his rival, together with the remains of his prize money to purchase stock, and then himself solicited the young woman's father to consent to her marriage with her lover. But the old man decidedly refused, thinking himself bound in honor to my friend who, when he found the father inexorable, quitted his country, nor returned until he heard that his former mistress was married, according to her own inclinations. What a noble fellow, you will exclaim. He is so, but then he passed all his life on board a vessel and has scarcely any idea beyond the rope and the shroud. But do not suppose that, because I complain a little, or because I can conceive a consolation for my toils which I may never know, that I am wavering in my resolutions. Those are fixed as fate, and my voyage is only now delayed until the weather shall permit my embarkation. The winter has become dreadfully severe, but the spring promises well, and it is considered as a remarkably early season so that, perhaps, I may sail sooner than I expected. I shall do nothing rashly, you know me sufficiently, to confide in my prudence and considerateness whenever the safety of others is committed to my care. I cannot describe to you my sensations on the near prospect of my undertaking. It is impossible to communicate to you a conception of the trembling sensation, half pleasurable and half fearful, with which I am preparing to depart. I'm going to unexplored regions, to the land of mist and snow, but I shall kill no albatross, therefore do not be alarmed for my safety. Shall I meet you again, after having traversed immense seas and returned by the most southern cape of Africa or America? I dare not expect such success, yet I cannot bear to look on the reverse of the picture. Continue to write to me by every opportunity. I may receive your letters, though the chance is very doubtful, on some occasions when I need them most, to support my spirits. I love you very tenderly. Remember me with affection, should you never hear from me again. Your affectionate brother, Robert Walton. Letter 3 
to Mrs. Seville, England. July 7th, 17, redacted. My dear sister, I write a few lines in haste to say that I am safe and well advanced on my voyage. This letter will reach England by a merchantman, now on its homeward voyage from Archangel. More fortunate than I, who may not see my native land, perhaps for many years. I am, however, in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose, nor do the floating sheets of ice that continually pass us, indicating the dangers of the region towards which we are advancing, appear to dismay them. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales, which blow us speedily towards those shores which I so ardently desire to attain, breathe a degree of renovating warmth, which I had not expected. No incidents have hitherto befallen us. That would make a figure in a letter. One or two stiff gales in the breaking of a mast are accidents which experienced navigators scarcely remember to record, and I shall be well content if nothing worse happened to us during our voyage. Adieu, my dear Margaret, be assured that for my own sake, as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. I will be cool, persevering, and prudent. Remember me to all my English friends. Most affectionately yours, R. W. Letter 4 To Mrs. Seville, England August 5th, 17th redacted. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it. Although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her the sea room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous especially as we were compassed by a very thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. About two o'clock the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts. When a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention and diverted our solicitude from our own situation, we perceived a low carriage, fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs, pass on towards the north at the distance of a half a mile, a being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveler with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the ice. This appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believed, many hundreds of miles from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not, in reality, so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track which we had observed with the greatest attention. About two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground sea, and before the night, the ice broke and freed our ship. We, however, lay to until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon the deck and found all the sailors busy on the side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge, like the one we had seen before, which had drifted towards us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it, whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other traveler seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered island, but a European. When I appeared on deck, the master said, Here is our captain, and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea. On perceiving me, 
The stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, said he, will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound? You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction, and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery towards the northern pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. <laughs> Good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen, and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he shewed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his sufferings had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin and attended on him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness, but there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness towards him, or does him any the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. But he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth, as if impatient with the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity, in a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, To seek one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him, for the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have doubtless excited your curiosity, as well as that of these good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would indeed be very impertinent and inhuman in me to trouble you with any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this he inquired if I thought that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty, for the ice had not broken until near midnight, and the traveler might have arrived at a place of safety before that time, but of this I could not judge. From this time the stranger seemed very eager to be upon deck, to watch for the sledge which had before appeared, but I have persuaded him to remain in the cabin, for he is far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. But I have promised that someone should watch for him and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Such is my journal of what relates to this strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very silent, and appears uneasy when anyone except myself enters his cabin. Yet his manners are so 
conciliating and gentle, that the sailors are all interested in him, although they have had very little communication with him. For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother, and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being even now in wreck so attractive and amiable. I said in one of my letters, dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean, yet I have found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. I shall continue my journal concerning the stranger at intervals, should I have any fresh incidents to record. August 13th, 17, Redacted My affection for my guest increases every day. He excites at once my admiration and my pity to an astonishing degree. How can I see so noble a creature destroyed by misery without feeling the most poignant grief? He is so gentle, yet so wise. His mind is so cultivated, and when he speaks, although his words are cold with the choicest art, yet they flow with rapidity and unparalleled eloquence. He is now much recovered from his illness and is continually on the deck, apparently watching for the sledge that had preceded his own. Yet, although unhappy, he is not so utterly occupied by his own misery, but that he interests himself deeply in the employments of others. He has asked me many questions concerning my design, and I have related a little history, frankly, to him. He appeared pleased with the confidence, and suggested several alterations in my plan, which I shall find exceedingly useful. There is no pedantry in his manner, but all he does appears to spring solely from the interest he instinctively takes in the welfare of those who surround him. He is so often overcome by gloom, and then he sits by himself and tries to overcome all that is sullen or unsocial in his humor. These paroxysms pass from him like a cloud from before the sun, though his dejection never leaves him. I have endeavored to win his confidence, and I trust that I have succeeded. One day I mentioned to him the desire I had always felt of finding a friend who might sympathize with me and direct me by his counsel. I said I did not belong to that class of men who are offended by advice. I am self-educated, and perhaps I hardly rely sufficiently upon my own powers. I wish, therefore, that my companion should be wiser and more experienced than myself, to confirm and support me, nor have I believed it impossible to find a true friend. I agree with you, replied the stranger, in believing that friendship is not only a desirable, but a possible acquisition. I once had a friend the most noble of human creatures, and am entitled, therefore, to judge respecting friendship. You have hope, and the world before you, and have no cause for despair. But I, I have lost everything, and cannot begin life anew. As he said this, his countenance became expressive of a calm, settled grief, that touched me to the heart. But he was silent, and presently retired to his cabin. Even broken in spirit as he is, no one can feel more deeply than he does the beauties of nature, the starry sky, the sea, and every sight afforded by these wonderful regions seems still to have the power of elevating his soul from earth. Such a man has a double existence. He may suffer misery and be overwhelmed by disappointment. Yet when he has retired into himself, he will be like a celestial spirit that has a halo around him, within whose circle no grief or folly ventures. Will you laugh at the enthusiasm I express concerning this divine wanderer? If you do, you must have certainly lost that simplicity which was once your characteristic charm. Yet, if you will, smile at the warmth of my expressions while I find every day new causes for repeating them. August 19th, 
17. Redacted. Yesterday, the stranger said to me, You may easily perceive, Captain Walton, that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. I had determined once that the memory of these evils should die with me, but you have won me to alter my determination. You seek for knowledge and wisdom, as I once did, and I ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you as mine has been. I do not know that the relation of my misfortunes will be useful to you, yet if you are inclined, listen to my tale. I believe that the strange incidents connected with it will afford a view of nature which may enlarge your faculties and understanding. You will hear of powers and occurrences such as you have been accustomed to believe impossible. But I do not doubt that my tale conveys in its series internal evidence of the truth of the events of which it is composed. You may easily conceive that I was much gratified by the offered communication, yet I could not endure that he should renew his grief by a recital of his misfortunes. I felt the greatest eagerness to hear the promised narrative, partly from curiosity, partly from a strong desire to ameliorate his fate. If it were in my power, I expressed these feelings in my answer. I thank you. He replied, for your sympathy, but it is useless. My fate is nearly fulfilled. I wait but for one event, and then I shall repose in peace. I understand your feeling, continued he, perceiving that I wish to interrupt him. But you are mistaken, my friend, if thus you will allow me to name you. Nothing can alter my destiny. Listen to my history, and you will perceive how irrevocably it is determined. He then told me that he would commence his narrative the next day when I should be at leisure. This promise drew from me the warmest thanks. I have resolved every night, when I am not engaged, to record as nearly as possible in his own words what he has related during the day. If I should be engaged, I will at least make notes. This manuscript will doubtless afford you the greatest pleasure. But to me, who know him, and who hear it from his own lips, with what interest and sympathy shall I read it in some future day? Well, now that all is said and done, I guess it isn't such a mini-episode, is it? Remember to hear the rest of Frankenstein? Just join Patreon like these lovely folks did. A huge thank you to Dee and Shane, Courtney Williams, Lisa W., Hannah Sexton, Medica Lady, Lisa Williams, EJ Cannon, and Isabel Suarez. Thank you so, so much, and I'm giving you and sending you a big, big hug. If you're okay with hugs, if not, then I'm just sending you some cool finger guns and a wink. Thank you so much. You can follow the show on Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit, Facebook, and Instagram, and I think that's all. Now, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.